hear me okay? Great. And you all get the red badge of courage for driving through that mess out there tonight. Um, yeah, good evening. And, um, you know, we all realize uh, the Indian River Lagoon is in crisis. And over the last several years, I know you have all heard opinions and, about what the factors are causing the problems we're seeing in the Indian River Lagoon. Fertilizers, grass clippings, dirt. And, you know, I, we actually heard this most recently, just last Thursday, our plenary speaker here at the Indian River Lagoon Symposium, okay, brought those out as, as the major factors behind this problem. And I keep asking for the data. Give me the data that really links these sources, fertilizer, dirt, grass clippings, to these algal blooms we're seeing. And the data haven't really come forward to make a compelling case. So show me the data. You know, that's one of the things we do as scientists. We work with data. We write papers, and they get peer-reviewed. So what I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about some of the studies we've done around South Florida looking at another issue, sewage pollution. And uh, Marie and I are going to be showing data tonight. Again, that's a fundamental thing we do here at Harbor Branch. Um, and it's going to show that the problem in the lagoon may not be, you know, what we've been thinking it is. We may have been barking up the wrong tree. That um, sewage may be a much bigger problem and perhaps have been overlooked by a lot of the, the uh, resource managers uh, that have been looking after the lagoon. And so with that, um, I think we'll get started. And a lot of this problem is, you'll see, maybe coming right out of our backyards uh, from septic tanks. <clears throat> okay, uh, the different topics I'm going to cover tonight are, we'll go quickly over the critical issues facing the Indian River Lagoon. And as you know from the title of the talk, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about bioreactors, how we've used them to understand the problems we're seeing in the lagoon, and also how the Indian River Lagoon itself acts as a bioreactor. We'll talk a little bit about the urbanization of the Indian River Lagoon watersheds, uh, how that has been engineered to increase the flow of nutrients and contaminants into the lagoon, and we'll talk a little bit about septic tanks. Uh, which have been referred to uh, by Florida Today in a major investigative story back in the mid-1990s as the unseen menace. Uh, of course, they're buried in our backyards. You know, we don't see them, but you're going to see tonight what they're actually doing to our surficial aquifer, to the quality of that water, and how that, being on the watershed, a lot of that ends up in the Indian River Lagoon. And we'll look also at how those nutrients, uh, once they're in the lagoon, uh, how they're processed in the so-called bioreactor of the lagoon. And then we'll look at where the septic tanks are. That's always a lot of fun, looking at the maps up and down the lagoon. And we'll wrap it up with then, what then must we do about this problem? And that's a quote uh, from the movie, The Year of Living Dangerously, um, that uh, What Then Must We Do was actually a book by Leo Tolstoy, but was a quote of Billy Kwan in that movie. Okay, so the critical issues facing the Indian River Lagoon, and I know you've heard a lot about these over the past several years, particularly the first one, the excessive freshwater releases. Uh, last summer and through the fall in the St. Lucie Estuary. I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight as well. But the broader problem up and down the Indian River Lagoon is the problem of excess nutrients and other contaminants as well. Uh, those nutrients lead to harmful algal blooms, loss of seagrass habitat, decline of fisheries, and unusual mortalities in wildlife. And I think many of you know last year was a record year for the loss of manatees in Florida. 813 manatees were lost, many of those in the Indian River Lagoon. So the problem of nutrients, excess nutrients, it's a, it's a big, big issue for our planet. It's linked directly to the loss of bio, biodiversity on our planet. And I refer to it as another inconvenient truth beyond global warming. <clears throat> 
The fundamental problem is uh, the accumulation of nitrogen and phosphorus on its way uh, to the sea in fresh water. And we see a couple slides here. This first uh, lower left slide is the uh, C44 canal discharges coming into the St. Lucie estuary. Middle one is closer to home, the Taylor Slough discharges just to the south of us. And the book on the right is a book I helped uh, write, um, a chapter in Clean Coastal Waters, Understanding and Reducing the Effects of Nutrient Pollution, published by the National Academy of Sciences. This uh, was published back in 2000, and it's really the definitive policy text for anyone that wants to do a little more extracurricular reading on this subject. So the bioreactor I'm talking about is a tool that we have used as scientists to study the responses of algae to these nutrients in our coastal waters and oceans. And if we go to Wikipedia for the definitive uh, definition of a bioreactor, you see that it's uh, any manufactured or engineered device or system that supports a biologically active environment. And what we see in these photos are three different chemostats that are commonly used as bioreactors for studying phytoplankton, single-celled algae, uh, in response to light, nutrients, and temperature. They're fitted with inflows in where the nutrient and media can go in uh, to nourish these growing cells. And one of the things that's very important is the uh, flow rate of media through these chemostats. If it goes through too quickly, you get cell washout, and the cells basically can't build up inside the chemostat. So that's what we call detention time or turnover rate. And that has special meaning to the Indian River Lagoon, as we'll see. Down in the southern end of the lagoon where we have more inlets, we get better flushing, we don't tend to see the big phytoplankton blooms develop compared to the northern IRL that is less well flushed. But we've also used bioreactors many years ago, as Dennis said, uh, in my early years here in the, in the mid-1970s, uh, to study macroalgae and how they respond to nutrients. And this is a photo from back in the day. Um, these were called screening troughs, where we looked at a lot of the different macroalgae in the lagoon as potential uh, target species growing from marine biomass for biofuels production. And one of the best and fastest growing uh, was Gracilaria, Tikvahi. Um, I don't know if you recognize that guy in the middle, but um, that's back when I had dark hair and a lot more hair than I have today. But I'm holding some Gracilaria there, and one of the great things we learned uh, back then by altering the flow rate of the flow through these culture chambers and the nitrogen concentration, we could grow this grassler at all different nitrogen levels and look at its growth rate as a function of nitrogen uh, availability. And the, the photo on the right, you see the straw-colored grassal area. That's very nitrogen limited. And the plants kind of stop growing when you stop giving them nitrogen. And they bleach out, they undergo pigment loss the pigments that make them dark, the, the, the uh, dark plants have high nitrogen content. Those are nitrogen-rich phycobilly protein pigments that uh, color those plants dark when they, uh, when they have lots of nitrogen. That will uh, come back up later in the talk. Okay, some other bioreactors that you might be more familiar with are sewage treatment plants. Uh, the conventional plant is shown here on the left, a lot of concrete and steel. Uh, they do consume quite a bit of energy, can also result in greenhouse gases, but this is um, what we use to treat our sewage. Uh, you know, it has different elements to it, primary settling tanks, activated sludge, trickling filters, final settling ponds, and chlorination or disinfection of the effluent. And from there, it can, it can be reused, as we're doing right here uh, to the north of us uh, in Indian River County. Now, off to the right, that's an aerial photo of an alternative type of uh, sewage treatment plant or bioreactor, which is actually pretty interesting from a biological perspective. It is fueled by the sun. These are uh, it's basically a solar-powered uh, system 
uh, and they're called uh, Advanced Integrated Wastewater Pond Systems. And this is a, a plant out in St. Helena, California, Napa Valley, that um, basically brings in the raw wastewater into the advanced facultative pond up there in the right. And that's a stratified pond where the raw organic waste at the bottom digests, kind of like in a septic tank. The nutrients are released from the organic matter through bacterial action. The nutrients come up to the to the top layer and then overflow into the high rate ponds that you see, the channelized ponds there, which are very shallow. And that water moves through slowly as phytoplankton take up those nutrients from the wastewater stream and convert the nutrients from dissolved nutrients like ammonia and nitrate into the algal biomass. And that algal biomass is then settled out in the algae settling pond on the upper left. And from there, uh, the effluent goes into the maturation ponds where it sits and kind of get a little more settling before the effluent goes out and is disinfected and chlorinated. That's a, a pretty neat system. Uh, we're going to zoom in now and take a closer look at the high rate algal ponds. This is when I was out there in 2008 at an algal biofuel summit in San Francisco. Thought it would be fun to go up to Napa and see uh, an example of these high rate algal ponds that you see here. But I wanted to point out the, the water. And uh, you can see the large amount of chlorophyll and phytoplankton in that water. It's not unlike what happened with the super blooms of algae in the Banana River or the brown tides that have um, developed recently in the Mosquito Lagoon. So we're going to come back to Napa later in the talk. Um, let's talk now a little bit about the engineering that took place uh, right here in the Indian River Lagoon bioreactor. Of course, uh, the whole problem of nutrients from human sources really started with the ice Indians. And of course, uh, they're the namesake for the Indian River Lagoon. The Spanish explorers named it after these Indians who go all the way back to 2000 BC, but were pretty much gone from the area by the early 1700s. And by the early 1800s, we had agriculture beginning on the watershed of Indian River Lagoon. That photo is from Merritt Island. And the big changes in terms of the flow of water and nutrients into the lagoon really started in the early 1900s when drainage on the watershed began. And that greatly expanded the watershed and nutrient loading into the lagoon. Not just water coming in now, but uh, as many of you know, we also were uh, dredging inlets to change the lagoon from a freshwater system to a more estuarine and marine system. And that began in the early 1920s. You can see here the dredge in the Fort Pierce Inlet. And that was followed in the 1950s by a lot of engineering up at Cape Canaveral. Uh, the first rocket launch in 1950, the Bumper 3, being followed by uh, the, the Russians that launched the uh, Sputnik uh, satellites. And that was followed by, in 1958, uh, the, uh, the formation of NASA and the space race. And of course, the 1960s on, we saw a lot of urbanization occurring on the watersheds of the Indian River Lagoon. So today, the Indian River Lagoon is about almost 40% uh, urbanized on the watersheds. Uh, agriculture comes in less than that at 24%. The natural forested areas, about 4.5%. Wetlands, about 12%. So you can see it's really become a human dominated watershed. And the nutrients and water coming in have led to this eutrophic condition of enriched nutrients in the lagoon. Uh, back in 2007, I worked with scientists at NOAA to rank all the estuaries around the United States. Uh, this is the National Estuarine Eutrophication Assessment. And at that time, we knew that uh, there was a moderate to high nitrogen input already into the lagoon and that had a high susceptibility for eutrophication due to the low flushing, particularly in the northern part of the Indian River Lagoon uh, between Ponce Inlet 
and Sebastian Inlet where we have um, really no, no inlets uh, in that area and the residence time of the water is quite high on the order of years. So what goes into the lagoon kind of stays in the lagoon and builds up as opposed to the southern lagoon. And we'll see uh, what that means for the processing of nutrients uh, in the so-called bioreactor. So we knew also in 2007 with population growth in Florida that the algal blooms were likely to worsen. And indeed, as we all know, that has been the case. So what happens uh, in the Indian River Lagoon bioreactor as nutrients build up in the system? Well, this upper left panel kind of shows the dynamic changes in the biology and ecology of the Indian River Lagoon. Going from a, a state on the uh, low nutrient side, on the left side, uh, where the system is dominated by seagrasses, which uh, historically dominated the Indian River Lagoon. And you can see as nutrients increase, you initially get an increase in epiphytes. And if you look down at the bottom photos, you see some Halliduli seagrass here becoming epiphytized by attached algae, filamentous algae that grow on the blades. And then as nutrients increase more, you get macroalgae, larger mat forming algae or seaweeds that then form thick mats over the seagrasses. And then with even higher nutrients and low residence time, as we have in the northern Indian River Lagoon, you get dense phytoplankton blooms. And that's uh, depicted by the, the brown tide over there on the far right end. So uh, as we've gone through the succession in the Indian River Lagoon, you can see up in the top right panel the problems it, it poses for seagrasses. We see the steady increase of seagrasses in 1986 at about 50,000 acres increasing up to about 2009 with a precipitous decline when we began experiencing the super blooms of phytoplankton and the brown tides. So we've lost uh, a tremendous amount of, of seagrasses uh, from the central IRL uh, northwards up uh, to the Mosquito Lagoon area. Now, the nutrients coming in to the lagoon come from either point sources or non-point sources. Uh, the point sources, such as the sewage outfalls that we always knew were a problem in the early years of urbanization, were largely eliminated by the Indian River Lagoon Act of 1990. But um, what hasn't been dealt with are the septic tanks. And they have continued to increase. Um, it's, it's really hard to get a good accurate count of the septic tanks, but we estimate somewhere around a quarter of a million non-vacant septic tanks currently exist on the Indian River Lagoon watersheds. And this is particularly problematic because the soils in this area are well known to be unsuitable uh, for septic tanks. And that's very clear in the USDA soils report for the state of Florida. In fact, that's true for most of the state of Florida. About 75% of the state is unsuitable. The contaminants that are coming into the soils from the septic tank effluent include nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, organic wastewater compounds, pharmaceuticals that we all use every day, hormones, as well as bacteria and viruses. So just simply assuming about two and a half people per, per septic tank, uh, an estimated nitrogen load going into the, the groundwaters on the watershed of the Indian River Lagoon is on the order of 2,500 tons of nitrogen per year tons. And the little schematic over here on the lower right just kind of shows how this works, how these um, drain fields of the septic tanks kind of trickle the effluent down through the soil into the groundwater zone below. And a real big problem in Florida and Indian River Lagoon in particular is the very short distance between the drain field and the water table that we call the Vados zone. Um, and uh, Marie's going to talk a little bit more about that uh, when she comes up later in the talk. We got to take a, a very detailed look at the problem of septic tank contamination of groundwaters and how groundwaters interact with surface waters in a study back in the mid-1990s working with the Loxahatchee River District. 
uh, in Jupiter River Estates, uh, shown over here. It was about an area of about uh, 400 homes or so that were on septic tanks, and really they knew at the time that they had serious problems in Jupiter Creek. You can see the water up there was pretty nasty. Had formed a lot of thick muck uh, on the bottom of this, uh, kind of filled in with this muck uh, uh, following the development of Jupiter River Estates. And one of the things we did was we, we used a groundwater flow meter to make direct measurements of groundwater flow as a function of tide coming and going out of Jupiter Creek. And we found a very interesting dynamic responses of the groundwater using this groundwater flow meter that had been built in Woods Hole, showing that during falling tides or ebbing tides, the groundwater actually rushes towards the creek, uh, as does the septic plumes carrying the contaminants, and that on flooding tides, as the sea level rises relative to the groundwater surface, that groundwater flow slows down and in some cases can actually uh, turn around uh, and uh, flow backwards uh, towards the drain field. But the net positive flow uh, is always, you know, uh, towards the canal uh, and we'll see the effects on the canal uh, in the data. But first we're going to look at the monitor well data. We have uh, on the left panel total nitrogen, total phosphorus, Look at that first in the monitor wells. Uh, let me see if I'm back up. I just want to show you where the monitor wells were. We had two residences in Jupiter uh, River Estates on which we had several uh, shallow monitor wells placed in close proximity to the drain fields. We also had a very deep well, 60-foot well, on one of those residences just to look at the difference between the deep and shallow groundwater. And we also had a monitor well very shallow, about 100 feet downstream from uh, one of the drain fields. And then we had this little red dot in MacArthur Park over here is one of our, our uh, shallow uh, monitor, uh, reference wells. The green dots show our monitoring stations in Jupiter Creek. Uh, and you can see uh, we had several in the upper creek and then several down here where the creek runs down into the Loxahatchee River. So the nitrogen, uh, when we look at it in the monitor wells, going from monitor well one to six, the first three wells are the deepest wells. And so you can see relatively little nitrogen in the deep wells. The nitrogen goes up in those shallow wells around the septic tank drain fields. And we see the same general pattern for phosphorus with one exception. The high phosphorus in the groundwater is primarily in the wet season. And that kind of shows us that the soils in the dry season are removing some of that phosphorus, but in the wet season, it kind of pushes the phosphorus right down into the groundwater. And so that that's, uh, can be a big effect at bringing phosphorus into the lagoon uh, during the wet season and nights like tonight, actually. On the right side are the reactive forms of nitrogen. Ammonium in the top, we see that monitor well four which was close to one of the drain fields at one of the residences, was quite elevated, uh, very high concentrations, typical of, of sewage effluent. And this shows that the nitrogen was not being nitrified to nitrate, which you see in the bottom panel, the other house, monitor well five, we had high nitrate. So uh, that house, of course, we were getting nitrification, which is a bacterial process that takes, uh, converts ammonium to nitrate. So that's basically the definition of a, of a failing septic system, the fact that that ammonium, which is the form of the nitrogen coming out of the septic tank, uh, was not being nitrified. And that could be related to the, the soils uh, or perhaps a very high water table, but clearly we were not uh, seeing any nitrification. And at the bottom monitor well six, that's 100 feet away from the um, drain field. You can see in the dry season there, we had very high nitrate at some distance uh, downstream from that septic tank. So if we look in the creek now, we can see that, uh, again, uh, the stations in the upper creek are the first three uh, on both uh, upper and lower panel. And you see elevated concentrations of total nitrogen, total phosphorus, 
in the Upper Creek area that are being most impacted by uh, these septic tanks. And if you would, just remember these concentrations we're seeing in this creek of, say, around 50 micromole of total nitrogen. Uh, we're going to come back to that when we look at the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, remember, this creek, we're measuring about 70% of the base flow of this creek is septic tank effluent. That's how much water is coming out of all those homes and coming down the creek. And it's very interesting that we're going to see very similar levels of total nitrogen up in the northern Indian River Lagoon uh, to what we saw in this study in Jupiter Creek. We see also the elevation of ammonium and nitrate uh, in the upper reaches of the creek. And you see concentrations of 10, 10 micromolar or so for ammonia higher than nitrate, around 6 micromolar, again indicating we have a lot of failing septic tanks. They're not nitrifying that nitrogen coming out of the septic tanks. And again, we know the soils in this area really are not suitable for septic tanks. So if we look at another approach we took in this study, looking at stable nitrogen isotopes, this is one of the new techniques we've pioneered in South Florida to be able to fingerprint the source of the nitrogen to see, for example, is it sewage nitrogen or is it fertilizer nitrogen? And you can see this uh, little table here of N15 values. Um, what these values are, they're the ratio of nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14. It tells us a lot about the source. And you can see septic tank effluent comes out at values of about plus 3 to plus 4 parts per mil. And it can go up from there as, as the sewage becomes more processed and either nitrified or denitrified. But that whole range for wastewater is very much enriched over the lower values you see in, for example, natural upwelling of the deep ocean, nitrogen fixation, a natural process, fossil fuel nitrogen in the atmosphere, fertilizers. 95% uh, of fertilizers fall between a narrow range of minus 2 to plus 2 parts per mil in soil. Everglades peat also very low. So by measuring uh, the stable nitrogen isotopes either in the water or in plant tissue, we can identify the source of where that nitrogen is coming from. And if we look at the monitor well data for water samples, you see very clearly that the deep the deepest well has the lowest value below that threshold for septic tank effluent. As we come up into the shallower wells, you see that value go up, indicating human wastewater nitrogen in the, in the shallow aquifer. And we see a, a very similar pattern in Jupiter Creek down below, where all the values are above that three um, parts per mil uh, value. That's the threshold for wastewater nitrogen. So that tells us we, we have a lot of wastewater nitrogen up at the top of the surficial aquifer flowing into Jupiter Creek. We also looked at fecal coliform in the wells. And we see, again, you can see much higher levels in the wells in the wet season than the dry season due to the infiltration of the waste uh, in the soils uh, from the rainfall and the higher water tables as well. You have less veto zone. So a uh, much bigger problem of coliform transport into the groundwater and also into the creek as well. And of course, it's no surprise, we typically always find higher coliform levels following rain events. And this is one of the major reasons why. The caprostanol compound, this is a fecal sterol um, produced by higher mammals. We also looked at that, that's commonly used as a tracer of human fecal contamination. Again, these are the sediments of the creek. You can see the bottom photo shows what those sediments look like, uh, like kind of like black mayonnaise, but you wouldn't want to eat this stuff, though. Um, it's uh, pretty, pretty foul stuff. And it, it, like I said, it had built up in the bottom of the creek. Everyone had watched this happen over many years. But you can see the very high concentrations of caprostanol, very conservative tracer. These compounds actually attach to the particles and uh, build up over time. Fecal coliform come and go. Those guys, they stay in the sediments. 
So we got a chance uh, following the hurricanes of 2004 and during the hurricanes of 2005 to look at septic tank impacts in the St. Lucie estuary. We sampled it um, in June and November of 2005, right when they were releasing water as they did this past summer. And then in March of 2006, after the flows had been shut down, and it was very clear that the discharges had a major effect on the estuary, bringing the salinity down to about zero, lower dissolved oxygen, higher nutrients, turbidity, and the coliforms were higher. Uh, and we know that there are quite a few septic tanks on the watershed in the basin of the estuary, and the highest coliform values were right up in the canals and tidal creeks, just like Jupiter Creek. Uh, where those low salinities and really freshwater conditions combined with the high nutrients allowed these coliform levels to not only uh, become high but stay high. And this is, of course, what we saw last summer with the coliform levels being so high that the, the whole estuary was pretty much shut down to recreation uh, throughout the summer and part of the fall as well. Uh, it's interesting that the highest turbidity nitrate, total nitrogen, was in the South Fork, directly impacted by Lake Okeechobee, but the highest ammonium and phosphate was in the North Fork, uh, which is impacted by, again, by in-basin uh, nutrient loads from the C23 and C24 canals. And uh, the toxic green goo, uh, algal blooms, the microcystis that appeared in the uh, estuary back in 2005, it appeared again this past year. Uh, we've measured the stable nitrogen isotopes in that, and they match up with a uh, wastewater source, not fertilizers. Okay, so we think that is largely being driven by wastewater coming from the basin itself, uh, because these blooms this past summer were not as bad in the source water in Lake Okeechobee where that organism came from. They were really forming right in the estuary itself. So we then took, um, more recently in 2011, 2012, we took this study, Indian River Lagoon Wide. And there's been a lot of studies in the lagoon, but this was the first to really look at the entirety of the lagoon using the same methods and also uh, using stable nitrogen isotopes to identify the major sources of nitrogen fueling these algal blooms. So we measured nutrients, uh, isotopes, um, at three different samplings um, during this period of time. And the goal was to improve water quality in the lagoon by providing high quality user-friendly data to resource managers and policy makers. And of course, I got a chance to do that this year, uh, both in the special uh, select state hearing in, in uh, Stewart in August, and then again on in D.C. in the House and Representative Patrick Murphy's hearing, uh, I took a lot of this information there. So um, we're hoping, of course, to get uh, federal attention, right? Uh, you know, bring this up to a, a national crisis level to get some support for uh, future projects um, to help uh, the recovery of the lagoon. So the data I'm going to present now are going to be in the representing the different segments of the lagoon. I'm going to show, for example, Mosquito Lagoon data, Northern Indian River Lagoon data, Banana River, Central IRL, and the Southern IRL, as well as some reference sites um, that are located just outside the lagoon uh, along some of the coastal Savalarid uh, worm rock reefs. And I'm also going to break out for you uh, three of the sites in the central IRL that are in Indian River County, just so those of you in Indian River County can kind of see how that county um, compares not just with the central IRL, but also the, uh, the lagoon-wide data as well. So this is kind of how we'll go through the data. Again, Mosquito Lagoon, Banana River, Northern IRL, Central IRL, Southern IRL, and our reference sites. This is the salinity, okay, uh, indicator of where the fresh water is coming into the lagoon. And again, the three samplings, uh, the beginning of the summer in 2011, which we call the dry sampling. This followed a, a multi-year drought 
So we kind of think of that as a kind of a, a first flush event. And this is, as you'll see, this is the exact time period when the super bloom took off in the Banana River. And then we have the wet season of 2011, followed next year by the sampling in 2012. Now these are grab samples where we go up and down the lagoon collecting these samples. And what you see very quickly here is a, a very clear freshwater influence in the central IRL, much lower salinities, okay? And if you look at those little yellow hash marks, you can see how water management in Indian River County tends to hold water in the dry season and then release water in the wet season. So in addition to just the, um, you know, the hydrologic cycle of rains coming and going, Obviously, water management affects the salinity in the lagoon to a major extent, even in the, here in the central IRL. You see the highest uh, salinities in the Mosquito Lagoon, up around 40 parts per thousand or so. But if, if you remember the low salinities here in the central IRL, you're going to see, again, how that dictates where the nutrients are really coming into the lagoon. They're being carried by the fresh water. Well, this is the chlorophyll A data showing uh, where the big phytoplankton blooms uh, developed during our sampling. And as I said, the uh, first sampling in 2011, the dry, we saw the super bloom in the Banana River and followed by the brown tide in uh, our wet season sampling in 2012. And, you know, the point I want to make here is this, these are unprecedented phytoplankton blooms. We um, routinely don't see chlorophyll A levels much over about 30 micrograms per liter. So um, these, of course, if you look at the photo of the brown tide over there, you can see what a problem this is when you have that much chlorophyll in the water, uh, reducing the light that the seagrasses need to grow. Uh, the dissolved inorganic nitrogen, I just want to go through these quickly. You see how high that is in the central Indian River Lagoon? Where is it coming from? It's being carried by fresh water. Remember, the low salinity in the central IRL. See the same thing for phosphorus coming into the lagoon. Uh, a major contributor to those low salinities and high nutrients is, of course, the St. Sebastian River, one of our monitoring sites here. We look at the total dissolved nitrogen lagoon-wide, a very clear trend of increasing total nitrogen as we go from the south to the north. And remember the concentrations in Jupiter Creek where we had all the septic nutrients coming in? That's basically the same concentrations as we're seeing up in the Mosquito Lagoon, Banana River, and northern IRL, exactly where we're seeing these super blooms of uh, phytoplankton and brown tides develop. You see the 50 micromolar IRL target. We're well above that going all the way uh, from central IRL northwards. Clearly, you know, to get this uh, lagoon in recovery, we need to get that nitrogen down. Uh, total dissolved phosphorus, um, slightly different pattern. Again, as we saw previously, it's coming in with the fresh water in the central IRL. And uh, you see the IRL target, 1.7. Again, we need to get that phosphorus down below that target value. Now, this is very interesting, too, the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. That can tell us a lot about where the nitrogen is coming from. Uh, what happens, the, the plumes of septic nutrients moving through the soils, as you saw previously, it can remove some of the phosphorus, but not the nitrogen. The nitrogen moves quite freely through the soils and the groundwater. And that results in very high nitrogen to phosphorus ratios. And you can see, again, as we go northwards from the central IRL, look at the very high nitrogen to phosphorus ratios we're getting in the northern IRL, Banana River, and Mesquite Lagoon, values of about 60 up to 80 or so. And you're going to see uh, in Marie's talk, she's going to show how right here in Indian River County, we're seeing this effect uh, downstream of the septic tanks. So uh, this is what we call ecological stoichiometry, how you can actually identify the source of these nutrients by their ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus. So it's not just the overall concentration that we're worried about, 
uh, when it comes to nutrients, but their ratio also of nitrogen and phosphorus. And we'll come back to that in a minute when we talk about the toxins that are being produced uh, in the lagoon. Uh, many of you probably were here a couple weeks ago. Dennis uh, gave a primer on the Lobos that we're now using here at Harbor Branch to better understand the processing of the nutrients within the Indian River Lagoon bioreactor. Uh, it's, it's great to um, you know, have grab samples like we did in the previous data just to compare with the, the um, TDL target concentrations, but if you really want to know how the bioreactor is functioning, it's really great to have this continuous high quality data. And I urge you all to go to the, our dedicated interactive website and you can make some really pretty graphs like these on the right. I just wanted to quickly show you the, the, the nutrient dynamics of fresh water coming in and how nutrients go up. That top panel is phosphorus concentration uh, in red and salinity in green going from June through September. And you immediately see how as the salinity drops with the, with the wettest July on record, look at all the phosphorus that came into the lagoon. The next one down, same thing for nitrate. You see all the nitrate coming in. And then the bottom panel shows the response of the ecosystem, percent saturation for dissolved oxygen, which is another problem we're having, low oxygen and hypoxia in the lagoon, which uh, eliminates habitat. Uh, for things like fish. So the final thing we did, as I mentioned we, earlier, we uh, measured stable nitrogen isotopes in the macroalgae. And this, this was a, a really neat way that we could use these macroalgae as bio-observatories. They assimilate the nitrogen out of the water, uh, they, they incorporate it into their tissue, then we can sample the algae and figure out what that source of nitrogen is. These are just a number of the different species we collected. And here are the results. And uh, this was very, very telling, very, very informative about what's happening to our lagoon. If this was all fertilizer nitrogen, these values would be much lower, down below plus two. Okay? They're not. They're way up, uh, averaging about 6.3. And uh, we, we see the threshold again of plus three values above that, indicating increasing presence of, of wastewater. And when we compare the red box, that's our overall average for the Indian River Lagoon. Let's compare it to Boston Harbor to the left of it back in the 90s when all the sewage from the city of Boston was going into the harbor, neck and neck with the Indian River Lagoon. Houston, we got a problem. Uh, Roberts Bay, Florida, over here on the far left, uh, we've had a chance to work over there with the Sarasota Bay NEP. That bay is a small bay uh, with uh, Philippi Creek, a drainage basin with tens of thousands of septic tanks draining into it. You can see its value very high as well. And you can see all the values above three are septic tank impacted coastal waters that we've studied in and around South Florida. The value on the far right is Florida Bay. So where's the water coming into Florida Bay? What kind of land use? Agriculture, fertilizers from the Everglades agricultural area, okay? You see the difference between the signal in the algae blooms in Florida Bay. It's not an urbanized watershed, it's agriculture. And we have many, many examples like that showing the, the um, the powerful uh, nature of these stable nitrogen isotopes to tell us the source of nitrogen. So we're going to actually go inside the bioreactor here and look at some of the algae and what they're doing in the lagoon. This is our St. Lucie 16 station. And uh, my assistant, Laura Heron, who's here tonight, you can see how we use quad rats to quantify the amount of seagrass coverage and the amount of algae growing on the seagrasses is epiphytes and macroalgae. And this is in the spring a couple years ago. And now this site is close to the Fort Pierce Inlet. It's pretty well flushed, but look at the algae overgrowing these seagrasses. And you can see why the seagrasses are having such a hard time growing in the lagoon. 
Uh, the seagrasses are being largely replaced by macroalgae, and this is one of them, Calerpa sertularioides. This plant looks like a seagrass, and it's sibling species here, Calerpa prolifera. They can grow under conditions of much reduced light and higher nutrients uh, compared to the seagrasses. So this video uh, was shot up in Shorty's Pocket, in Cocoa Beach. We wanted to go up and sample the macroalgae um, in a manatee die-off hotspot to specifically look for potential toxins. Because as the manatees have lost their primary food source, the seagrasses, they have increasingly turned to macroalgae in their diet. And so we're, we're getting suited up here, the ninja warriors. And we're going to go in and uh, collect some gracilaria and other drift red algae. Uh, and we, we sent those off to some of our colleagues up at the Hollings Marine Lab for toxin analysis. Now, we're looking at some grassal area. You can see if you were a seagrass down there trying to grow, you, you know, it wouldn't be uh, very easy under these thick blankets of macroalgae that grow very quickly. This grassal area plant can double its biomass in a couple of days when the nutrients are high, under high light in these shallow waters. But look at the color of this grassalaria in May. It's yellow. Remember the grassalaria that was nitrogen limited back in the mid-70s in our, in our screening troughs? Um, you're going to see a difference because we're going to come back in July after all that rainfall and we'll see, uh, see what those plants look like then. But here you can see Laura's technique for collecting macroalgae the toxins, of course, we take good, healthy plants that um, she's bagging up here. Okay, so we come back in late July after record rainfall, and you're going to see things have changed a little bit. Same exact spot in Shorty's pocket. And we go underwater. And okay, so the drift algal community here has changed a bit. You see the green? alga that looks like um, green monofilament fishing line. That's a plant uh, called Ketomorpha, and it's a very, very fast-growing plant. It is a plant we frequently find around sewage outfalls. It has uh, high demand for nutrients to form blooms like this, but when the nutrients are there, it grows, uh, grows very, very well. And so it was uh, all over the place intermingled with grassalaria that you see here. But look at the color of this grassalaria. You see how dark it is? Remember what that means. It's got higher nitrogen in it than it had in May, which makes sense. This is another plant, Acanthophora, one of the uh, algae that overgrew Kaneohe Bay in Hawaii uh, due to sewage pollution back in the 1960s and 70s. And of course, these things are dead giveaways that you got a sewage problem. These are cyanobacterial mats. If you um, go and walk around some sewer ponds, uh, you'll see these thick mats growing as scums on the surface of the ponds. And of course, when we saw those, we thought, well, maybe it's time to get out of the water. Um, these can produce a lot of pretty nasty toxins. And you can see around Shorty's Pocket, the highly urbanized area around there. And so we, uh, we had no trouble collecting a lot of grassalaria. And again, you can see the, the highly pigmented, nitrogen-rich nature of these plants. Well, we sent them off for toxin analysis to Charleston, and we also analyzed them for their N to P ratio. And of course, what happens uh, with these plants when they become phosphorus limited, they, uh, they stop growing, but they can still photosynthesize and they have high nitrogen. So what they can do is produce toxins. And uh, sure enough, what we found, both the May and July samples had very high toxin activity, but especially the July samples, tenfold greater toxicity in July with a higher nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. Uh, these are the results from the Hollings Marine Lab. These are toxic glycosides, okay, that are being produced by grassalaria that can cause severe enteritis in manatees that are eating these plants. 
and other problems. So uh, anyway, um, just want to close up before Marie comes up with this one slide. I know this is the information you've all been waiting for. Where are these septic tanks? And so, I, you know, you came out tonight. You could be at home watching the Olympics. So I'm going to give a gold medal to the county that has the most septic tanks tonight uh, and the most nitrogen loading into the lagoon. And where would that be? Volusia County takes the gold, over 1,000 tons of nitrogen per year. 48% of the population in Volusia County rely on septic tanks. The national average is 25%, okay? They're double the national average. Okay, the silver goes to Brevard County, okay, just to the north of us, 720 tons of nitrogen per year. And Indian River Co County comes in with a bronze medal, 325 tons of nitrogen per year. Indian River County, 55% of us in Indian River County rely on septic tanks, over twice the national average. The, the clean award, the clean and green award goes to St. Lucie County. <laughs> and that's great. That's where we are tonight. And uh, the mayor of Port St. Lucie early on recognized the problems of septic tanks in this area. And I think maybe you read the story in T.C. Palm, a really great story. Uh, they, they did the right type of planning to plan for the future and had municipal sewers. Hookups were only $2,000 cheaper than a septic tank. Uh, Martin County, 291 tons of nitrogen per year. So it's interesting where we have all those septic tanks, the biggest problems in the lagoon are up there in the north, the brown tides and the super blooms where we have... Um, really high nitrogen loading from groundwater going into the lagoon. So Marie is going to come up now and uh, talk a little bit about Indian River County, her thesis work, looking in detail at uh, the septic tanks. Okay. Can everyone hear me? We had some issues before. Um, before I go into my thesis project and talking about Indian River County, I wanted to go over Florida septic tank regulations. Um, if you had a septic tank installed in your home before 1983, the drain field, which Brian talked about earlier, um, is six inches above the groundwater and 25 to 50 feet away from an, a body of open water. Um, after 1983, those regulations changed. They got a little bit better. Um, two feet, your drain field had to be two feet above groundwater and then 50 to 75 feet setback. Um, if you had a septic tank installed before 1983, you didn't have to dig up your septic tank and move it. They're actually grandfathered in. And even if you have a septic tank set up like this, you don't have to move it if you have it repaired. If it's repaired um, and it's working fine, you can keep these, the setback and the vados. Um, and then also some suggested maintenance would be to pump your septic tank every three to five years and have it inspected every five. So we'll get into Indian River County. Um, this county has four drainage basins, one for the South, Main, and North Relief Canal, and then the Sebastian River. Um, there are more than 36,000 septic tanks in Indian River County, and about half of them were installed before 1983. As you can see here in green are the septic tanks that were installed before 1983, and red is after 1983, and it's about a 50-50 split. For my sampling, in October we did a wet season sampling and in March we're going to do a dry season sampling. Um, here are the drainage basins outlined for each of the canals and the river. Um, for groundwater sampling, for the Sebastian, we sampled at four locations along the river. For the canals, because there's a north and a south portion, we sampled two sites on the north and two sites on the south for each canal. For the surface water, we sampled at four sites along the canal and then at one where each of them um, opens up into the Indian River Lagoon. We're collecting all of that stuff that Brian was talking about earlier, um, inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus as well as total nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and then for indicators of a human source, fecal coliform, um, optical brighteners, which are found in detergents. So when you wash your clothes and they look really clean and bright, um, those are those optical, those are optical brighteners that are making them, your colors look a little bit brighter. Um, what happens is they go through the septic tank, they'll be in the groundwater. Once they hit 
um, the surface water, they actually get broken down by UV light. So you'd find them in the groundwater if um, that water is being contaminated from a septic tank. Also looking at caprosinol and the N15 isotopes Brian talked about, um, we're looking for the nitrogen isotopes in the water for the surface and groundwater and also macrophytes, which I'm sure you've seen driving along next to canals, there's water lettuce and then also duckweed. So talk about the St. Sebastian River. Um, the surface water and the groundwater, uh, inorganic nitrogen and inorganic phosphorus levels. You can see from site one to site five, as you go from the back of the river to the front, um, there is a decrease in the amount of nutrients, and that's probably because the, the changeover of the water um, increases as you go from the back to the front. You can see the groundwater levels, there's very high amounts of nitrogen in each of the groundwater sites. Site two was actually taken at a cypress preserve um, so not as much uh, of uh, not as much as a, of an urbanized area, which would be why that's a little bit lower there. The North Relief Canal. Um, these are on the same scale as the Sebastian, so you can see it's much lower. There's much less concentration of septic tanks here. Um, these pictures I wanted to show that were the back of the canal versus the front of a canal. Each of these canals have a control structure. The back of the canals, the waters much higher, moves much slower, and then as you get to the front of the drainage basin, the canals get more channelized and the water moves much faster. You can see there's a decrease from the back of the canal as you move forward um, in the surface water levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. And then the groundwater, there's lower um, groundwater nitrogen in the north than in the south for the North Relief Canal. Uh, this is the main relief canal. Again, the control structure. This is a photo of the control structure, if you guys haven't seen what that looks like. Um, and you can see same similar trend from the back to the front until you get to sites four and five where there's a, a spike of nitrogen um, in the surface water. And then the south um, groundwater samples are actually lower than the north groundwater samples for the main relief canal in levels of nitrogen. So the south canal, same thing, monitor well. Um, the surface water, the nitrogen and phosphorus in the back um, decrease as you move from the back to the front, but increase when you hit the Indian River Lagoon. And then there's a higher level of nitrogen in site two for the south and north than site three. You can see the amount of septic tanks around site two there. Um, so the ratios of, these inorganic, of this inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus, I wanted to split it up in... Um, between the drainage systems. The surface water nitrogen to phosphorus ratios are much lower than the groundwater. There's a much higher influence of nitrogen in the groundwater than there is in the surface water. And then here is a graph of the um, N to P ratio split up from site for each of the drainage basins. The colors match. Um, and you can see there's a general trend of, from the back um, the N to P ratios are a little bit higher than, and then decrease, um, except for the main canal where there was that high nitrogen input towards the end. Um, so looking forward, we're going to be sampling in March again for the dry season. Uh, the high N to P ratios in the groundwater are an indication that there's nitrogen coming in to the groundwater um, from a source. We're going to use the caprosinol optical brighteners and the nitrogen isotopes to draw a line to the source of that nitrogen. And then um, hopefully this project will continue a year after, um, after I'm gone. And uh, we hope to add sucralose, which is an artificial sweetener, to be another tracer for a human source of the um, nutrients that are coming into the groundwater and surface water of the canals and the river. And that's it. Back to Brian. Isn't it great what our graduate students are doing here at Carver Branch? Um, okay, so we're just going to wrap up then. What then must we do? We're at that part of the talk. Uh, can we save the Indian River Lagoon? Well, we don't have to look too far away, uh, just directly across the state to see a case study uh, 
of where this nitrogen problem was recognized early on in the 1970s. In fact, when I was over there at the University of South Florida, this was all happening. It was the buzz. With all the great science going on at University of South Florida and, and St. Petersburg, um, we, we knew there was a problem in Tampa Bay. This watershed had become urbanized in the 50s and, and going forward to the 80s. The same problems we see in the lagoon today were happening uh, baywide, eutrophication causing algal blooms and seagrass loss. It was actually the odor problems in Tampa Bay from the decomposing macroalgae blooms that caused public outcry to do something about the problem. And everyone at the time realized it was sewage coming into the bay and largely nitrogen in the sewage driving this problem. So the Grizzle Fig Act was passed, which required advanced waste treatment of the sewage, and it decreased the nitrogen loading to the bay by about 90%. That, together with improved urban, industrial, and agricultural stormwater management, has turned the problem around. And already, 8,000 acres of seagrass recovery has happened. And with 10,000 more acres, they will reach their 1950s aerial extent. And so they are well on the road to recovery. Uh, to summarize what I've talked here tonight about, um, clearly nutrients in the Indian River Lagoon are above those threshold concentrations that we know cause these algal blooms that uh, are harmful to seagrasses. The high end 15 values in the macroalgae do not support the idea that this problem is being driven by fertilizers. It's, it's pointing to sewage. Uh, and in many cases, wastewater coming right out of our backyards, but not just septic tanks, but leaking sewage collection systems and wastewater reuse as well. So this means we really have to think about strategies to just remove uh, nitrogen from all these different sources of wastewater. Previous studies in Jupiter and Tequesta demonstrated the couplings between septic tanks, groundwaters, and surface waters in the tidal creeks. And you saw in Maria's data, this is happening right here in Indian River County. And the Indian River Lagoon is acting as a natural bioreactor to process these nutrients, much like an advanced integrated wastewater pond system now with those big phytoplankton blooms we're seeing up in the north with severe ecological impacts on the biodiversity and health of the resource, including toxin production in grassal area. So an IRL-wide program really is needed to address nutrient reduction strategies and specifically focusing on wastewater and removal of nitrogen in particular. And we're talking about expanding and upgrading municipal sewers uh, on the watersheds of the Indian River Lagoon. So just in closing, I want to point out that the recovery of the Indian River Lagoon really does depend on you. Um, we saw what happened when the public became mobilized this past year over the issues of the Lake Okeechobee discharges. But the issues are not just the discharges. As you see, there are uh, severe issues Indian River Lagoon wide, particularly in the northern uh, reaches of the lagoon. And the politicians do respond uh, to the public. I just want to close by thanking my entire team Team HAB uh, shown here. It's a big lagoon. It's a big problem. And it takes a, a lot of talent to, uh, to study the, the various aspects of the problem. Uh, a lot of people over here I want to acknowledge for their help uh, over the last several years. Uh, last on the list is Brian Cousin for helping with the video that I showed today. Uh, the funds for our research in the Indian River Lagoon came from the Save Our Seas license plate. And I want to thank my, my colleagues at Geo Hydros, Dr. Todd Kincaid, uh, and his assistant, Brent Meyer, for uh, helping with uh, estimating the nitrogen loads uh, coming from septic tanks on the watersheds. And you remember I said we're going to go back to Napa Valley? I want to end on a high note here. So uh, there is a great story. Um, after touring the Napa wastewater treatment plant, 
Uh, of course, he can't go out there without doing a little wine tasting. So I went to Tula K Winery, and this is the proprietor, Bill Cadman. He produces some amazing wines. I'm sipping on a uh, Pinot Noir, not Merlot, Pinot Noir, award-winning bottle, who's just fantastic. And in, while I was there sipping on this with Bill, he goes, you know, a lot of the wine, the grapes that we grow out here, use wastewater, reuse water. I said, really? It tastes so good, Bill, this wine. <laughs> and, um, you know, Jesus made wine from water. And you know what they're doing? They're making wine from wastewater. And I thought, you know, this is a, a really great uh, way to end up. There are some really beneficial things we can do with our wastewater other than dumping it in the Indian River Lagoon. Anyway, thank you all uh, for coming out tonight. I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have, and Marie will as well.